today. I see some familiar faces, and I think some of you might have been with us last year. We're glad you're back. Um, we want to thank Potomac Case Management Services for being such great friends and partners on this um, event and for allowing us to use their beautiful facility. If you need to use the restrooms while you're here, they are out in the atrium, and you go to the far end and take a left, and they're right on the left by the vending machines. Um, we will have a box lunch at 11.45 that will be set up out in the atrium. And um, if you have any questions while you're here, you can just ask any of the Brooklyn or Potomac Case Management folks. And uh, we hope you get around to see all of the vendors today. Um, at this time, I'm going to introduce Chris Florian, who's the Director of Development at Brooklyn. Morning. 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 I just want to take a moment um, to introduce uh, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Bill Hunsberger. Um, it's through his generosity that uh, this event was funded, um, so we want to thank him very much um, for his support. Um, Bill uh, started his career at Brook Lane and then uh, went on to private practice, um, but his vision for this event was born out of his caregiving for his wife, Sylvia, um, who uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So uh, we greatly appreciate his support uh, for last year's inaugural event and then this year's event as well. Um, but just wanted to thank him very much for his support. So with that, I'll introduce Bill, and uh, he'd like to say uh, some words about his journey. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> thank Chris and the Development Council of Brooklyn for getting this event together. It was one that had a, had a personal interest in just what I went through, I figured, you know what, a lot of people must go through being a caregiver. It's not something that you ask to do. It's something that you pretty much drift into. Uh, about, uh, my voice is a little bit tenuous today. I was just getting over bronchitis, and about 10 days ago, I was thinking about getting a caretaker myself, <laughs> to be honest with you. But uh, I feel good, it's just that my voice is, is a little weak. Uh, so, let me, sh sh uh, share a little bit about my journey. Uh, I believe that being a caretaker is probably one of the toughest jobs you could ever get. And most people don't really want to volunteer for such a job. It's just hard to do. 2013 was a big year for me. <clears throat> I had two cataracts removed. I had the right knee replaced. I started pickleball in September and back to skiing in December. However, what I didn't know was that 2013 was also the year that Sylvia started her, her slide. So <clears throat> there I was, I had 38 years in the mental health field as a clinical social worker. And who would think that somebody with that kind of experience wouldn't be able to care for somebody? But it's not as easy as you would think. So you just kind of get into it. There are a lot of uh, as long as people have been on this earth, we've had uh, caregivers. Often the families were extended ones, uh, often the children lived nearby, and they were able to help out. But over the years, different factors contributed to needing caregivers. Increased mobility separated families, and uh, with increased medical care, uh, many families needed help along uh, with the medical care they were getting. So over time, what began to happen was caregivers became more professional. So it's not uncommon to see <clears throat> most people who have a caregiver as somebody who's actually paid to do the job. I mean, some are more professional than others, but uh, that's the way it seems to be going. Uh, there are many things that affect the ability for a family to have a caregiver. <clears throat> One might be, let's suppose that a person has an accident or a disease that they need special care. Not everybody is able to handle, let's say, somebody with a wheelchair or so on. And sometimes uh, you, some members will try to step up to the task, but they're not really able to do it. And when somebody is forced to step up to be a caregiver, maybe because the family can't afford it and so on, uh, if they're forced into it, that's not the best thing because I said the seeds for failure are probably there because uh, caregiving takes a, a lot of extra effort and sacrifice. My wife began her trip 
pro probably around 2013, and really a, probably a year passed before you really knew what you were getting into. At first, it was sort of like um, she had like an attitude. She would, uh, uh, you know, as we grow up, the first five years, our parents teach us there's certain things you don't say, right? You, you have to, so we, they develop a filter, you know. And then, you know, little kids don't have that filler until they get to be, so, so, some people never get the filler, but, <laughs> <laughs> but well, most people do. And uh, so her filter was kind of getting thin, and so she would say things like, if somebody was grossly overweight, instead of saying to me, oh, she, oh, she'd say, well, is she ever fat? I mean, out loud. <laughs> so, things like that. And uh, I can remember, uh, I remember being in the supermarket. That was always a fun thing to do with Sylvia. Because what I would do is I would leave the cart and I'd have her in the back. So she, so she would follow along. <clears throat> and every once in a while, I noticed the cart was really light. And she wasn't pushing because she wasn't there. <laughs> and so she would go, <clears throat> and sometimes she would, I'd go around the aisle and she'd be there. She'd be hugging somebody. It could be a man or a woman. She, you know, she was, you know. And, uh, or she would be having a conversation, trying to have a conversation. In the last three years of her life, she couldn't talk and she had problems choking. So all this added to the, the, uh, the caregiver's um, job. Uh, and so uh, you get into all kinds of things like about choking, swallowing, security, and so on. Falling, constipation, uh, there, there are so many things that you have to deal with. And one of the things, as people know me, is I, I have a propensity to use humor uh, once in a while. And uh, so humor, though, is an excellent thing to deal with some of the seriousness of this problem. Because uh, I think you don't have a sense of humor, <laughs> and I can't last very long. Uh, some examples, of, we used to hide a key at our back door. <clears throat> And uh, so, you know, you didn't have to get the key out of the time to get home. Well, of course, Sylvia knew where the key was. And every once in a while, I would go out to the garage and get something, and she would take the key in. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'd come to the door, <clears throat> and, uh, and she'd be inside the door. She'd be smiling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 so <clears throat> I think that she just wanted to, you know, she was still in charge, you know. <laughs> But anyway, so I hit a second key. I had to take care of that problem. But, but there were things like that that you would go along. And you, you don't laugh at them at the moment, but as you go along, you, you begin to realize that uh, it was kind of funny. So you go through various stages, and it, it, with Alzheimer's, there's no rhyme or reason to it, except you realize that it's a downhill slide. Uh, and you just, you know, try to make the best of what you can, and so on. So you realize that this is not something that you can do totally alone. So after a while, I began to get some caregivers who would come uh, four hours a day, five days a week. And that was great. That gave me time to, <clears throat> to go and uh, exercise, play pickleball, and do other things, and be with other people. However, that only it still left me with 20 hours a day. And they were sometimes the hardest times because they're the times when you had to feed, uh, bathe, uh, and do all kinds of things like that. <clears throat> so, uh, some of the things you'd run into, like nobody ever trained me how to bathe a woman. You know, I mean, <laughs> I had certain ideas what bathing a woman was, but. It, it wasn't what they were thinking, right? <laughs> anyhow, so, <laughs> in a, anyhow so, but, so what would happen was, in order to, to wash, we would just get in the shower and wash. That's what we'd do. That worked pretty good for a while. But then Sylvia started getting, um, her balance started going and so on. And I think sometimes she'd be dehydrated. And when all the hot water would hit her, it, it kind of affected her. And so, on one or two occasions, here we are, we're all soaked up, cleaned up, and so you just shoo, sag. So now I'm thinking, get two people here, we're both soaked up, we're on the floor, 
So what do I tell the 911? <laughs> 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 so uh, anyhow, we worked it out. But it, it's not. And it, you ever try to let somebody get soaked? <laughs> and, trust me. Do you have? How did that work? Uh, <laughs> it worked. It was only a one-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I was only a one-year-old. <laughs> well, Yes, yeah, I'm glad you can understand. That was sort of different. Yeah. Okay. There was another time, and you never knew what you were getting into. Sometimes in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, she would be very security conscious. So she would get up and wander through the house, make sure there was nobody else in the house, and so on. And uh, so one time down in Myrtle Beach, in our condo down there, at three o'clock in the morning, I hear somebody, a man, come into our bedroom, and he says, Bill. And I go, oh God, home invasion. <laughs> <laughs> now, he said, are you Bill? I said, yeah, what do you want? You know? And he said, I think I have your wife here. <laughs> she, she walked out of the car, and she was down, took an elevator down, she was in the parking lot, which was a gated parking lot, so she really couldn't leave, I guess. But, and she couldn't talk at that point. So the only way that they found who, who I was, was she pointed out our car, and in front of the car, there was a number, the condo. And, that, and, that, and that's how we found it. So after that, I had to invest in some small alarms for the door and stuff like that, extra lock. So your life keeps changing, you know, it gets tough. Um, family members were helpful. Uh, I had two sons, and neither one was really great with taking care of, of uh, uh, toilet needs, you know, with a mother. Which, you know, that's, that's a lot to ask of a, of a son, I think. But uh, they were helpful, and on two occasions I was able to go to a, uh, two different pickleball tournaments that were eight days each, and uh, they helped cover it with some other people. And it worked out well, and it gave me uh, a chance to sort of recharge my batteries. And I think that's important as a caregiver is that you need to have some respite. So that's something to think about if you're a caregiver, to, to find a way to get away at least a couple days at a time if you can. <coughs> I know money is always a problem, too, because uh, care, uh, paid caregivers don't come cheap. And it uh, <clears throat> cost you a lot of money. <coughs> so during the, about the last five years, excuse me, I'm really, I'm dry, hold on. <coughs> so during my last, the last five years, I uh, was talking with a friend of mine, Rick Cass, who used to be a head of hospice. <laughs> and I, I told, I said, Rick, is hospice strictly just end of life? And he said, No, it's not. And uh, so we talked, and uh, so I hooked up with hospice. And the best part about hospice for me was the visiting nurse. And I don't know if you know Cassie Day, but she happened to be the nurse, and she was great. And uh, so she would come, and uh, over a period of five months. Uh, <coughs> She, she gave me a lot of information, and I think had I passed the test at the end, I could have become a nurse practitioner. But <laughs> <laughs> she, she was good. But uh, so a little funny story about that. Uh, well, there was a period of time when Sully would get constipated, and so after five days, Cassie came to visit, and I said, Cassie, Sylvie's all bound up. We have to do something. She says, okay. So she puts on her gloves and takes Sylvia in unblocks. So things are great. Things are moving. And uh, we put it on extra laxatives and so on. But guess what? Five days later, we got the same problem. So I call up Cassie. I said, Cassie, listen. I said, Sylvia's got the same constipation problem today as she had five days ago. I said, what are we going to do? <clears throat> she said, put the glove on and go for it. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that, but she was, you know, so, you know, I just moved up another step in my career. <laughs> but, uh, so, so 
finally, after a period of time, you, be, you go, go through a lot of things and you begin to realize that this is really more than you can handle, you know? And so you get to a point where you say, you know what, it's too dangerous here for her to stay here and something bad is going to happen. And uh, so we arranged for her to go to the Farney Katie Memory Care Unit, which was a beautiful unit. It was almost brand new. And uh, uh, every, the families love it. And I don't know that residents are aware how nice it really is. But it, what was nice, and the people were nice also. But <clears throat> so she goes in the end of January of 2020. And guess what happened in, in February? COVID hit. And so uh, she never got COVID, but everybody started wearing masks and family got shut out. And so there she was. She was out of contact with reality anyhow. And she didn't know anybody, no family. And I think she started to really give up. Uh, so they let us back in after eight days, but she only lasted two more days after that. Uh, so, <clears throat> but I think she was, you know, ready to go and it was, it was difficult, but uh, being with somebody at the end of their trip is a very uh, tough thing, but it's an enlightening experience. And that's a, probably a topic for another time uh, to talk about losing a loved one and how you deal with that, right? So, but what I wanted to go to <clears throat> in, in closing, I wanted to uh, uh, I have a list of about eight things that <clears throat> came, came to me as a result of my experience. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Let's get rid of my notes. <clears throat> I could run it down my throat. Okay. So number one, maintain as many relationships with others as possible. Be honest with them about what is happening. Two, get medical help. See all the medical specialists recommended. And also sometimes use Dr. Google can be helpful. I learned a lot about swallowing problems and, for example, uh, learning the causes and ways to deal with that. So sometimes Google is good in that. Maintain or start an exercise program because it will help you deal with stress that you're surely going to have. Number four, don't feel you can do it all yourself. Allow yourself to accept outside help. You do not you did not fail, your problems have just become more than one person could handle. Number five, be aware that what was once a safe place for this person could now, <clears throat> could now be a very dangerous environment. <clears throat> for some, such as a person who is confined to a wheelchair, there needs to be space to move around, like sometimes moving furniture, sliding doors, or even taking out a wall could be very helpful for somebody who stays in a wheelchair. And it would make it, make it possible to keep them at home as opposed to moving them on. Always try to keep your sense of humor. And number eight, be, uh, being a caregiver will be a little like riding a roller coaster. You'll have highs and lows. For some, Religion will offer much comfort. For most, involving other people will offer the support you will need to survive. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <clears throat>